Our Pinterest boards and Instagram save pages are filled with body inspo, tips to make more money, and mindset upgrades. But what happens when your pursuit of personal growth makes you feel bad? Maybe you can relate to one of these statements. I read more self-help books than anyone I know. Other people don't seem to need them as much as I do. What's wrong with me? My mindset changes with every self-help guru I come across. Because of this, I don't follow through on any of my goals. I am all or nothing and exhausted. I'm either killing it with daily cold plunges and 8% body fat or binging on Oreos and vodka. My next guest's personal growth journey began at 16 when she entered a rehab center for drug addiction and mental health issues. It continued at 19 when she became an evangelical Christian. Since then, her journey has taken some winding turns. She's now a licensed professional counselor, author, and host of the podcast Struggle Care, where she shares skills for survival and self-kindness for her fellow self-help rejects. Today, we're going to discuss the pitfalls of progress and how much is enough as we ask the question, is self-improvement a rat race? Wildly practical, medicated and messy, fellow add -er Casey Davis. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Self-Help Rejects, for the record, would be the most awesome band name ever, I'm just saying. Oh, I totally agree. <laughs> I want to ask you about your experience with the Teen Rehab Center in your church. They helped you a lot, but they also kind of conditioned you to hyperanalyze your every thought and action as the only way to progress. Can you kind of share what that looked like? Yeah, I mean, especially in the context of rehab, where I felt like we were always constantly ranked, where there was people that were doing good and there were people that were doing bad. And when you were doing good, you got more privileges, you got more praise, you had a different standing in the community. And it truly was this like social system that they had created where when you were engaging in behavior that was considered unhealthy, like there was a lot of social shaming and boxing out and losing of privileges. And the whole thing was meant to try and kind of force a bunch of drug addicted teenagers who didn't want to get better to get better. Right. And I don't necessarily have the magic way to do that. But the effect of that was you really married acceptance and love with doing well emotionally. Especially in a childhood development stage where you are supposed to be caring about what your peers think about you. I could really see where that would cement your emotional and mental habit of over analyzing and self criticizing every single thing you did. You know, I know in my church community, we would always examine our motives, right? Are my motives pure? Yes. It was this tyranny of introspection almost. And like, I remember having this moment. I actually went on a year long mission trip. And at the end, I was so homesick and I, I wanted to go home. And I was really feeling like a failure like not wanting to continue to do this mission trip. And I remember like crying one night and realizing like I truly did have a very real faith and I still have a very real faith today. But in that moment, it kind of cracked open for me like, wow, like a lot of my pursuit of quote unquote, the things of God, I was blind to how much the acceptance and praise of my culture and my community was driving that. I see. Yeah, that that would definitely set you up for a sticky mental environment in your adulthood. We all know the benefits of working on yourself. I mean, it's not all bad, right? It's not all you don't want to <laughs> throw in the towel completely. Going to therapy, eating healthy food, those are all positives. But what are the consequences from that pursuit of betterment when it tips into the obsessive zone? I think the big difference for me was like, we should want to be healthier for functional reasons. Like we should want to have introspection so that like we can, you know, have better relationships and our life can be better. And I think for me, it went beyond just I want to be sober. I want a better life. I don't want to be in pain anymore. And it went to where like it was more about if I'm not always progressing, always doing better, always, you know, 
being sanctified or always looking at my side of the street, if I'm literally missing any opportunity to self-analyze like where I could be doing better, then I was either at risk of relapse or God being mad or just like the community around me not accepting me. And so it becomes like I, I I tend to talk about how when I was using I was trying to gain acceptance from the people around me by like, being the perfect drug addict. Wait, like, what? Yeah, like <laughs> I wanted to be. Mean? Well, like I just, I never felt like I could do the girly things girly enough. Like I could never be the good blonde cheerleader that everybody thought was sexy. And so I rejected all that. And it was like, I'll be the dingiest, grungiest, into the best music, the funniest. Like, you know, I'll use a lot of drugs and I'll be this like cool drug addict. And that will get people to like me. I'll sort of like, embody this sort of Kurt Cobain beautiful tragedy like like I just wanted to be the best at being very cool in a very broken unhealthy way and what I realized was I ended up taking that same pursuit of feeling worthy through people's acceptance into just doing healthier things so I still feel empty I still feel worthless I still feel sort of like bounced up and down whether I feel like good that day bad that day about myself depending on my progress. It's just like now I was doing about healthy things. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so now. Yeah. It was like a copy paste. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's- like I didn't actually undo this part of me that felt worthless, that needed other people to tell me that I was okay, that I was loved. I just went to a different subculture and tried to embody their values. And in your work, you know, as a therapist, as a coach, How do you see this showing up in other people? You obviously have your story of that kind of copy-paste, the consequence that developed from that very specific stage in your childhood development. How else do you see it show up in other adults? I see it a lot with, you know, you had that quote about like consuming a lot of self-help content and kind of feeling really ashamed that you don't have it together or have your life together. And then you feel ashamed. And then that shame motivates you to pick up the next self-help book or the next system. And there's this overnight, like, you know what? Starting tomorrow, everything's different. We're going to eat like this. We're going to walk like this. Like everything's going to be different. And then you like basically go all in on a new book or a new philosophy or a new system. And you do that for five days, five weeks, (laughs) five months, whatever. And then you get exhausted. Because you're just constantly performing, even when no one's around. And the, the, the satisfaction that they're getting from it is from the, I'm doing right. I'm doing right. I'm, I'm being the kind of person that could be loved. And that doesn't sustain long-term motivation to keep doing things. And so eventually it falls apart and they don't do it anymore. And now they feel more shame because they failed. And it becomes, like you said, a rat race where I can't be lovable unless I have it all together. And if I self-improve enough, I'll be lovable. Does the pendulum swing then for these adults that maybe, you know, they're like, okay, well, let's just chuck it all in the fuck it bucket. You know, like none of it is going to work. And then they go off the deep end. Because the reason I'm asking that is I'm wondering, like, what's the harm in this, right? Other than the internal battle, the internal struggle of, everything you just said the shame and the bad feelings about yourself but outwardly are there are there serious external consequences to continuing to run on this hamster wheel yeah well it certainly makes depression worse it makes anxiety worse it can make a lot of obsessive things worse and you can and some people see this swing where we're doing what we should do because if I do what I should do, that'll get me loved, but I'm not actually experiencing any like functional value in my life. I'm just holding it together. And then I get tired or I get burnt out and I swing all the way over to all the things that I want to do that are, and we kind of do this like, well, if I can't hold it together, I might as well blow it out, right? And so if I can't wake up at 5 a.m. every day, screw it, I'll just sleep all day, Mm. right? If I can't, you know, have the super strict diet, screw it. I'll just never eat a vegetable again. And it's really hard for us to get okay with the gray area of if you find yourself realizing, I haven't had a vegetable in a while, it's okay to just eat some broccoli. 
Like you don't have to make a big proclamation. <laughs> you don't have to switch your whole diet or throw everything out and like just eat some broccoli right but, then. But Casey, I mean, if my Facebook friends don't know that I'm on a new program, how will I ever succeed? Yeah. What is your litmus test for figuring out if a person or maybe someone listening to this, the litmus test for themselves to know if they're in the healthy zone of personal growth or if they've, or they're teetering on the edge of the danger zone? So I will say like because of my background, I always like to say if not optimizing yourself means that you will be thrown out of your community or that something really horrible will happen. So if you've been told you're going to relapse, if you're not always optimizing, you're going to go to hell. If you're not always optimizing, even things that can get into wellness culture about like you're going to get cancer, right? Everything is toxic. Everything is this, everything. You know what I mean? Like just this, if there's a real black and white of like you're not always optimizing, always self-improving, this horrible thing is going to happen to you. That's not a healthy environment. And if you also find yourself like if everything is hard and fast and 100% followed by collapse, that's another indication because real quote unquote self-improvement, it's low and it's slow. And to an extent, there's some um, like self-satisfying movement to it. It's not this hurry, this panic. And also, what is the feeling that's motivating you? Do you feel motivated by self-kindness? Or do you feel motivated by shame and fear of rejection? Those are really good tipping points to know what direction you're headed, hopefully before it's too late. For you, how did you come back to a healthy middle ground? So this is going to feel kind of counterintuitive, but when I left my 12-step group and when I left my church, I didn't stop being sober. And I didn't stop being a Christian, but I left these groups where everything was tightly controlled and all of this focus was on kind of like this purism, like being a pure, always looking at your motives, always looking at your side of the street, always doing things healthy. And what was interesting was I spent these like extended periods, like breaking all the rules. Like when I was in my 12-step group, like I meditated twice a day every single day for seven years. And if I didn't, I would have to email my sponsor and be like, hey, I didn't do this. And then she would kind of like yell at me about it. And I'd be like, okay, there's like atonement, if that makes sense. And then all of a sudden I was like free from that. And like for the life of me, I could not bring myself to meditate. And in my old world, that would be like doing bad or regressing or backsliding But actually, it was a lot of progress because I had to spend this extended period of time, like almost not doing the things that I used to think were the self improvement things the diet, the exercise, the meditating, the spiritual stuff, da da da, to really get to a place of being like, I'm actually just okay the way I am. Like, if I never improved from today, I'm worthy of love. And after that, like, it was an extended period of time, I started to get to this place where I was like, maybe I would like my body to feel better. I really don't like the way I just handled that. I wonder if there's a way I could deal with that emotional issue that would would help that. And like I had to like almost wipe the slate clean and get to a place of finding out what it feels like to want to do something from a motive that wasn't just, I want to be loved. How did you realize that was your motive though? I think a lot of people struggle with even knowing what their own voice sounds like when they've heard the voice of their community for so long. So to some extent, I would say that if you find yourself like racking your brain, how do I know where, how am I doing it? Am I doing it this? Am I doing it that? Because if it's from my community, then that that means like I'm not doing it right because then I would just be doing it for their sake. But maybe I'm doing, I mean, what does that sound like to you? Psychosis. It sounds like what we've been talking about. Like what if it's like not that big of a deal for you to get that answer right? Oh. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the same old obsession of I have to figure out what my motives are. Like I have the to get it right. Answer. Yeah. It's like, I don't know, man, like probably a little of both. Like probably you have real faith and you just think that you'll be loved if you're a good Christian or like probably you genuinely like would like to work on yourself and worry, you know, you know, have the, this motive of if I get it all together, I'll be loved. Like probably it's both is the thing you're doing. Like, you know, is it helping? Okay, do you want to do it? All right, do it. Oh, you don't want to do it? Okay, maybe no, do it for for a little bit and see what happens. I think that's 
the the big difference. It's this, if you find yourself being like, which one am I? I have to figure it out because if I can't figure it out, it's like, okay. <laughs> if you feel the panic, mm. like what if it's okay for you to not be all knowing? Yeah, that could be really unsettling for someone who is who has been on that hamster wheel for a long time, the treadmill of self-care to just stand still would feel like going backwards. I, I was like free falling. Yeah. And and that would, I could see where they would definitely need some support. Um, yes. I was interested in how you were describing your own internal process as, huh, what if, and oh, isn't that interesting? Because that sounds to me a lot like curiosity and experimentation what role do those two things play in somebody's journey of free falling do you think i think that you said it perfectly like there's this gentle curiosity that is very different from the obsessive panic because obsessive panic says if i don't figure it out i'm doomed and it's all on me to figure out right um and then gentle curiosity is like, hmm, I wonder what would happen if I tried this for a while. And if it doesn't work out, I can always try something else. There's this, there's this care. There's this self-compassion. How do we quantify enough, right? Because especially for those of us that come from an athletic background, quite competitive. And mm-hmm. then if you compound that nature with things like the self-help communities that are out there. There's so many. Yoga, fitness, CrossFit, the church. How do you, in in the noise of all of that, figure out what is enough? How do you feel the satisfaction of being in a good place when you are also in these communities or maybe adjacent to those communities? I think the first is to try as much as possible to step back from the self-judgment of labeling whether you're in a good place or a bad place. And, you know, for me, it's kind of hard to give generalizations, but I know for me, like, I I need to do what it takes to stay sober um, because when I'm not sober, it's, you know, one step forward, eight steps back, right? So I want to be in a place where I know what I need to do to stay sober I know what I need to do to not be like really hurting the people around me on a consistent basis. Not that I don't make mistakes, um, but I'm not being abusive to anybody. I want to do what it takes to be able to make a living, to be stable. I don't beat myself up for being late to things or for messing up, you know, the beginning of a recording. But <laughs> if I if I find myself in a place where I can't, I consistently can't make it to anything, and so I'm not getting paid, and so I, right, like. It's kind of like, here are my basic needs. And if I'm not able to meet those basic needs, I definitely need some heavy support. And it might be a period of intense sort of working on some things to get to that place. But once I'm in that place, optimizing from there doesn't have to be on a really heavy time schedule. It doesn't have to be this big like failure or success. It it can just be, what, what do I want to work on this season? And Mm -hmm. what does working on that look like to me? And is working on myself maybe require me not working on myself for a while? These seem so much like Mm -hmm. (laughs) ungoals. Because I wanted to ask you, what's the healthy way to set and miss goals? But as you were talking, I was like, well, you're kind of describing that, but it's not really that, you know, 12 steps to set healthy Mm -hmm. goals. It's almost like becoming a person who is in a better place to set and miss goals in a healthy way, you have to (laughs) reverse it and flip it all on its head. Would you agree? Or is there something else that you would add in a strategy to set and miss healthy goals or goals in a healthy way? For me, you know, I have a job that I enjoy. I have a family that I really love and and I don't, there aren't any major behaviors that are like self-sabotaging the things in my life that I really love. And I, I, I can't say that I've made a goal in the last 10 years, truly. Like, I, I have some major things in my life that I love that bring me joy that I'm not self-sabotaging, right? And I can honestly say that I've even let go of having goals, really. 
you know, like, and I, and I wrote a book and then I got a book deal. And so obviously like I have to turn this book in at a deadline. I guess you could call that a goal, but, and I, I don't know if that's for everyone, but I, I know for me, like it's been just an extended period of like just existing, just existing. Yeah. Oh, I, I like that. I think. <laughs> And I've done some things like I've gone to therapy in that time. I've gotten yeah. my medication in that time. You know, I've done things because I didn't, you know, I was, I had depression and I needed some medication or I struggled with this. And so I went to therapy. Like I did things, mm -hmm. but I, I, I don't have like a, like a, like a map in my head of now where are we going next? That's so opposite of my entire framework of thinking, but I enjoy the experiment of sitting on that and I enjoy the mindfulness I think that I'm hearing in between the lines of what you're saying that would be gained from that also before we sign off I wanted to ask you as the queen of practical hacks <laughs> if you have any other practical advice tips etc that you would want to offer people who are trying to leave the self-improvement rat race? Yeah, I think this is what I want to leave people with is that when you experience distressing feelings, if you are typically that puts you in a place where you're not safe physically, that is an indication that we need a plan. We need goals. We need to figure out some stuff. Let's get that taken care of. Once you are in a place where you are going to be physically safe when you experience distressing emotions, I really want to encourage people like when because what happens when you're from those backgrounds that you and I are when we feel a distressing feeling that's what kicks in the panic that's what okay something's wrong I'm not optimized I'm not being healthy I'm not I have to fix something like what would it be like if you just sat with those feelings and you didn't try to fix them and you didn't jump right to is this a sign that I am not doing well what if we just welcomed those feelings in, allowed them to exist, and just got curious, like, how long will they stay? And not, you know, we don't, I'm not saying go to bed, don't get out, but check that, that panic. Check that I have to fix these distressing feelings. Like, maybe distressing feelings are just a part of life sometimes, and they come, but they also go. I love that. Tell people where they can stay in touch with you, find your podcast, all the things. Yeah, so I'm on a TikTok on, at Domestic Blisters. And I have a podcast called Struggle Care. I have a book called How to Keep House While Drowning, which is a gentle approach to cleaning and organizing when you're str struggling with anything. Um, and I have a website called Struggle Care that you can basically find all those things from there. I've got some cool downloads and resources and, and my TED Talk is up there. So that's kind of the easiest way to find me. Perfect. Thank you so much. This was really good. Thanks. <laughs>